Good morning. We're glad you're here this morning at the gathering. Let's stand together. Gathering Baptist Church, uh, Pastor Wes here with Pastor Francis, and we just want to take a moment and talk a little about the upcoming marriage tune-up weekend, February 7th and 8th, and uh, with Jeff and Debbie McElroy and how important that is for our church. So we just want to talk to you about that. So Francis, tell us a little about the, uh, the conference and why we're having this and why it's important for us as a church to be doing this. And Jesus said this in the Gospel of Mark, that what God has joined together, let no man separate. And I was reminded of a wedding I did one summer, and I got to the end of the service, and I said, what God has joined together, let no man celebrate. <laughs> and so I still think about that, and I've, people poke fun at me about that, but, but sometimes I think we've forgotten about what the joy of marriage is all about. And in, in my years of over 30 years of ministry and weddings I've done, I'm, I'm sad to say a lot of folks aren't together. And I think it's because um, we go into marriage not understanding that, that, it's, that God ordained marriage, that it's for life. Uh, and sometimes we go into marriage and we don't have the tools on how to deal with conflict, how to deal with a, our, our family past upbringing, our systems. And so we struggle and, and sometimes we, we just decide, it, I just want to do this more. And so what these marriage retreats do, um, this is a marriage tune-up. So it's just like when you take your car in to, to, to have the maintenance done. 
This, these kind of marriage events, especially with, with Jeff and Debbie, uh, they're going to help us give us some tools on, on how, to, um, how to do marriage, some practical things. Because sometimes when we talk about marriage, we have all these philosophical ideas about what marriage is. But sometimes we just need to know how to talk to our wives, um, how do we handle conflict. And so these are the kind of things that we're going to talk about. So we can truly say this, that what God has joined together, uh, let no man separate. Instead of the joke that I said, let no man celebrate. Because we want to celebrate what God has done for us and through us in marriage. Awesome. Uh, one little question maybe for the people who are sitting out there thinking about, well, I don't think I should come to it, or maybe I'm not. They're kind of waffling. Uh, or maybe think, oh, my marriage is perfect. I don't need this. What would you tell those people, whether they've been married one year, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, why this is important that they be a part of this weekend? Because first of all, none of us are perfect and we can always, we can always do better in what we're doing. And, and so you're thinking, well, well we, we got something pretty good. I think that's great, but it can always be better. And think about this, you're not just doing marriage for yourself, but if you're a mom or your dad, you're modeling what marriage is all about. And so to take the time to go to something like this sends a huge message to your kids and your grandkids about how important you are to each other. And so I think that's a great understanding of why it's important. You know, and another thing is, you know, part of our, our, our vision statement is to be biblical, missional, relational. Well, don't we want to grow in our relationships with each other? And don't we want to grow in intimacy and, and just closeness with our spouses? So I think that's one of the most important things about coming. And look, and if you can't afford it, you know, um, talk to Pastor Wes. He'll pay for it out of his pocket because because he's got all the, he's got money bags right now. Got it. If not, Jonathan Plastic will do that. JP. JP will take care of it. Yeah. So you know, so don't make money an issue. If that's an issue, come come talk to Pastor Wes. Come talk to me. We'll, we'd love to talk to you about it. So hey, church, uh, get signed up. Uh, go on the website, do that through the app. You can go through the kiosk at one of the campuses. Get signed up. And we look forward to seeing you at the marriage tune up. Hey, Wes. Um, one important thing too, if you got a friend that's a non-believer, a couple that's a non-believer, this is a great way uh, to, to share the gospel with them, to invite them to come along. And, uh, and I do believe that there will be some scholarships for folks who, who don't know the Lord. Yeah, the heart for Jeff and Debbie is if they are unchurched, they come for free. Uh, if they are serving in the military or if they are first responders, it's their heart to let those people come and be a part of that. So absolutely, we love that. So it's just not for people within the walls of the church, but also to our community and your surrounding neighbors as well. Hey, we can't wait to see you at the marriage conference. Hey, Gathering Baptist Church, uh, Pastor Wes. That's Pastor Wes. <laughs> He's from the Gathering Baptist Church and really wants you to come to the marriage conference. <laughs> Hey, uh, welcome this morning. We are so glad that you're here with us at the gathering at our Plaza campus. Uh, if you are a first time visitor with us this morning, there's a connection card in the pew right in front of you. Grab that for us, fill it out. You can throw that in the offering plate at the, uh, here in just a few minutes uh, as, we, as we pass those around in just a second. Um, but we are so excited about the things we have coming up. One of those is the marriage conference that you just watched that video on. We would love for all of you to be there. Uh, whether, like they said, whether your marriage, you feel like your marriage is strong and good right now, fantastic, come anyways. Whether you feel like you are, uh, no, matter, no matter your thought process on marriage right now, we would love for you to be there and just to engage in everything that we have going on at this marriage conference coming up. Uh, in your bulletin, you will find a small little brochure and it tells you the schedule, it tells you the dates, basically everything that you need to know can be found on those two pages about the marriage retreat. But if you have other questions uh, about the marriage retreat, by all means, come find one of us pastors and we will try to get you uh, connected with whatever information that you need, okay? Uh, we would love for you to sign up. I think right now, uh, I know we have a lot of folks planning on being there, but I think right now we only have like four couples signed up. So I know a lot of people are planning on being there. And so if you are planning on being there, please uh, jump onto the app real quick, sign up, go ahead and sign up for, for the marriage conference coming up in February. If you don't have any idea what I just said, sign up on an app. I have uh, ways to help you out, okay? You can come see one of us at the kiosk right out here in the, uh, at the, what is this, the east entrance, I think. Come see one of us out there at the entrance, and we will get you signed up on the iPad out there. Uh, we'd love for, to do that for you, okay? Uh, there's also some, some more sheets out there. You can find some more information about the marriage conference and sign up via paper if you'd like just to sign up on a piece of paper. You can do that as well, okay? Uh, lots of stuff coming up, but again, we just really want to emphasize the marriage retreat uh, and get you signed up for that. It's going to be a great thing. Lots of stuff in the bulletin. You grab that, use that, peruse through it uh, uh, this week. Like I said, lots of stuff coming up, so use that as a reference point for all those things as well, okay? Um, so I know that a lot of you are excited about today because you're wearing red. Woohoo! Oh my gosh. 
<laughs> so I know a lot of you are excited about today, but good news, the Chiefs don't play until 2 o'clock, okay? So we got plenty of time for Jesus right now, okay? Amen. Huh? Do I get a woohoo on that one too? There you go. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Preach on, brother. Preach so on. We're gonna, so we're going to spend some time with Jesus this morning, well before the Chiefs play, but we're all going to root for the Chiefs this afternoon, so it's going to be good. And so, but in the meantime, why don't we stand up, go find somebody you haven't seen in a while, shake their hand and say hello. listen to me anyways. <laughs> All right. Hey, so we want to spend a second as we just continue into our time with the Lord this morning corporately. We want to spend a minute uh, to just stop, to calm our hearts, calm our minds, and pray to the Lord. And here's what I want to ask you to do this morning. Uh, so we just watched this, this video on our marriage retreat coming up. Our small group has been walking through a Bible study on marriage right now. And in a lot of ways, as a church, as pastors, we have recognized, as Francis said, we have recognized there are, just, there are a lot of marriages, maybe even yours, that's struggling right now. There's some stuff going on in your relationship with your spouse that's just hard. Or you know of a couple that's just struggling right now. And so this morning, in our time with the Lord, before we really press in to everything else that we've got going this morning, we want to spend some time this morning, I want to encourage you, as we pray this morning, to pray for your spouse, to pray for your marriage. Maybe you're one of those that you're like, yeah, yeah, we, I, but I feel like we're good right now. Okay, great. I'm glad that you're good. Pray for somebody else's marriage then. Pray for the couple sitting next to you. Pray for the couple that you know right now, like, oh, their marriage is on the brink of... Pray for them. If that means, listen, I want to encourage you, don't make this weird, but if that means that you stand up as a couple and walk across the room and pray for another couple, man, praise the Lord, okay? Beautiful pictures of the church coming together to pray for one another, all right? So let's spend some time praying. Pray for your marriage. Pray for another marriage. Pray for your spouse. Walk across the room and pray for somebody today, all right? So let's engage with the Father uh, this morning for just a little bit as a church. Let's pray. God, this morning we, we praise you for you and you alone are worthy of praise. You alone. God, there is 
no one, no thing in this world or outside of this world that has done what you do. God, you are maker and creator of all things, sustainer of all things, redeemer, <laughs> redeemer of all things, God. And we know that and we believe that to be true, Father. For you have redeemed us and saved us. Thank you for the shed blood of Jesus, our Christ. Thank you for Jesus today, God. It is in him that we live and move and have our being today, God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the opportunity to gather with your people. God, around your word, around your songs, that we have the opportunity both corporately and personally to pray to you and that you hear us, God. You hear our cries of thanksgiving. You hear our cries of, of requests. You hear our cries of anger, our cries of anguish. And you hear our cries of help. You hear our cries of praise. Father, today, God, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, we are encouraged in marriage. God, we are encouraged even... God, as yesterday we were able to celebrate right here in this room a, a union of, of two couples who love you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and love and express their love for one another in the gift of marriage, Father. Father, we look around the room and we are encouraged by so many marriages and we, God, we know what marriage ultimately means and looks like and is a picture of and that is your love for your church, Father call it your bride, and that you promise, Father, you promise to redeem us, you promise to, to sanctify us, you promise to hold us close, you promise to, to keep us, as a good groom does. So thank you, Father, for being our bridegroom, for saving us, for redeeming us. But God, also, we are not ignorant, and we know that, God, there are the evil one loves to wreck marriages. He loves to tear apart this picture of your love for your body. He loves to ruin it, Father. And so, Father, we pray hope over hurting marriages. God, we know, we believe that you're a God of redemption. And we know that you can redeem even the brokenest of things. So God, even the, even the marriage that is, God, there just seems to be no hope left. God, we know, we know because you are God and you are good and you are the redeemer of all things that you can redeem and restore. So Father, we pray for those marriages that are just hard right now. Communication seems to not be there. Love seems to be non-existent. We pray for hope in those marriages, for endurance in those marriages, God. We thank you that you are God of grace and wisdom and power, that you can redeem and restore. And Father, this is what we are thankful for today as the body of Christ, that you have the ability to redeem and restore. So Father, our response is a response of praise. We sing and we sing loudly to you, Jesus. We read your word and we believe it to be true and we change our lives in light of it, Father. And God, we even give back to you today. God, we give to you in response to the good news of God, in response to the gospel. Father, because we love your word, we love what you have done for the world in salvation. And Father, we want to see the whole world come to salvation in Jesus. And so, Father, we give financially so that your good news can go to the whole world, Father. So as we give, God, help us to give in abundance so that your good news can go to the world, Father, today we pray. God, just be big in our hearts and minds and lives today, we pray. Be big. We worship you. We adore you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Psalms 19 says this. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. And they speak without a word or a sound. And their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth. Their word to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. And it bursts forth like a, a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. Like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens. Follows its course to the other end. Nothing hides from its heat. The instructions of the Lord are perfect. Reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commands of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more.
I stand. That's more than just a, a rote phrase. We understand that by his grace and his mercy and through his spirit, we can stand in boldness. Amen? That because of his conquering death and hell, we have hope. We have joy. We have peace. And that should be a celebration for us. So I want us to sing that, No Power of Hell. Sing that as, as believers who are excited to know they have freedom in Christ to believe, to with 
withstand anything that comes against them because they are held by the Savior and the Creator of the world. Amen? So let's sing that, No Power of Hell. Again, good morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab it. Turn it to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, we continue, continue, we're continuing on in our series this morning called All Things New, and we'll be here in 2 Corinthians 5. I love this text. I love everything that this text gives us, the way that it uh, encourages us, the way that it points us to Jesus. I love this text, and I love everything that it does for us, and so we're going to spend some time reading this text this morning and digging through this text this morning. Before we do that, though, um, the English language is really, it's a fantastic thing, isn't it? And next to impossible to actually learn how to use appropriately, okay? Has anybody ever been typing in a, in a Word document or anything like that, and all the little red squiggly lines or the blue squiggly lines or the whatever, that, like, autocorrects for you, right? This is... The English language is fantastic, and it is super challenging to actually learn to use correctly. Whether it's using uh, adverbs or adjectives or nouns or pronouns, uh, let's just talk about adverbs for a second. Adverbs, you've got adverbs of time. I know you're really interested in this, aren't you? Just deal with it for a second, okay? You've got adverbs of time. You have adverbs of manner, of degree, of place, and of frequency. Okay, just in adverbs, okay? And then, uh, so we think about this, right? And then there are adverbs of clause, okay? And these adverbs, and then there are adverbs you're not even supposed to worry about. Sometimes, you, you, sometimes we have to worry even about where adverbs are placed in the context of a sentence. I mean, all of these things we're supposed to think about and, and worry about in the context of the English, English language. And then there are these things called uh, conjunctions, Okay, then there are these things called conjunctions. Conjunctions are words that connect words or phrases in a sentence or in a paragraph. You've got these conjunctions, right? And these, uh, these words have all sorts of different nuances and connotations, but the reality is that conjunctions help build meaningful relationships in sentences and in paragraphs and things like this, right? And then to dive even deeper into the confusion still, because I know you're really interested, to dive even deeper still, we've got these things that we've been blessed with in the English language called conjunctive adverbs. You put both of them together. Okay, you've got these things called conjunctive adverbs. They're used as, basically, they're used as linking devices between ideas. They link whole sets of ideas together to show, basically, to show logical relationship between things, right? Paul gives us a great example of these conjunctive adverbs in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning. And so we're going to read through these, and we're going to use this idea and talk about what this idea of this conjunctive adverb and why it's important in our text today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 21 is where we're going to be today. So if you have your Bible, uh, hopefully you've gotten to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 already. We're going to start in verse 14. Read through the end of the chapter, and then come back and work through it verse by verse and see what the Lord has to share with us this morning. So it says this, 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, 
that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who, was for their, who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God, making his appeal through us. We implore you, on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you for this word. We thank you for your word, this text this morning, that we get to walk through, dig through, live into, God. God, this morning, you have so much to say to us, and we have so little time. So God, I pray this morning that you would cause our hearts and minds to be open and attentive to your word. God, cause me to think clearly this morning. Cause me to speak clearly this morning. God, cause us to be able to work through the word together. God, cause the listener, your people, Father, to hear your word and to be able to decipher your word and take it home with them this morning as well. God, Ultimately, we pray that your word would change our hearts, that, would, that your word would cause us to, to know and understand your word and your gospel even more, to believe it and to remember it, Father. And so, God, I pray that you'd be upon our hearts, be upon our minds, be upon my tongue this morning, Father. Help us to think clearly. Help me to talk clearly this morning, we pray. It's in your name that we do pray. Amen. I love this text, like I said, but many of us, uh, many of us struggle with this thing called nostalgia. You know what nostalgia is? Nostalgia is remembering things better than they actually were, or flip-flop of that, remembering things worse than they actually were. Okay, that's what nostalgia is, either remembering things better or remembering things worse than they actually were. Either way, in nostalgia, what happens is when we live in this nostalgic state, we fail to live into the present newness of today. When we live in the state of constantly thinking about either how good or bad things were, we forget to actually live in all the new things that we have in today. And Paul reminds us here in this text that Jesus changes everything. He changes everything because of Jesus. We see this right off the bat in verses 14, 15, and 16. Because of Jesus, I have a new perspective. Because of Jesus, I have a new perspective. We're going to see this in these few verses. The first thing that we see here, there's a few themes that we're going to see. The first theme that we see is that uh, in this context of a new perspective is that we have a new perspective because the love of Christ controls us. Look again at verse 14. He says this, for the love of Christ controls us. The New American Standard, maybe your translation says the love of Christ, Christ compels us. It encourages us. But compels and controls is more than just encourage, okay? It controls and compels us. It causes us to live and move and breathe to love differently. The love of Jesus Christ and Paul's love for Jesus changed everything in his life. The love that Jesus expressed down to Paul and Paul is expressing to Jesus in salvation changes everything. It changed Paul from a murdering Pharisee to an imprisoned apostle. It changed him from a, a church hater, a murderer of the church, to a church planter. It changed him from a prideful boaster to a humble servant. It changed him from this self-centered, arrogant man to, to being others-centered to a humble servant. Everything, it changed everything in Paul. The love of Christ keeps us from living from ourselves and instead it compels us, it causes us to pour out our lives for other people. This is what the love of Christ compels us, controls us, urges us to do. 
This is what Jesus changes. But why? Verse 14 goes on. Look at it again. For the love of Christ controls us or compels us or urges us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. Because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore our first conjunctive adverb. Told you it was going to be relevant. Our first connecting statement, this linking the device that points back to a cause and forward to an effect. Here's what it is. If we believe, okay, if we believe what we say we believe, that in the death of Jesus, the wrath of God has been satisfied, okay, if we believe what we say we believe, that in the death of Jesus, my sin, listen, not in part, but the whole was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. If we believe these things, then, therefore, there are many things, many things that have died with Christ. If this is what I believe to be true in my life, then there are many things that have died with Christ. All, in Christ, all my pride-filled boasting has died. In Christ, all my self-centeredness has died. In Christ, the pleasure of sin is pleasure no more. In Christ, I actually end up hating my sin. You see, verse 15 goes on. We have a new perspective because we don't live for ourselves anymore, but we live for Christ. Look at verse 15. He says this. Paul goes on, and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. This new perspective, because we don't live for ourselves anymore, but we live for Christ. Okay? Jesus changes the end in life. He changes the end in life, but Jesus also changes the means, how we get there, the purpose towards the end. He changes the end, but he also changes the mean. The goal in life is not just to get to heaven, friends, okay? The goal in life is not just to get to heaven. The goal in life is to live for Christ while on earth, to show the world what God is like. It's not just to get to heaven. It's to live for Christ while we're here, not just to live for myself, to live for others, to live for Christ. Not just to live for others, though, to live for Christ, right? I love my family love my family, okay? But my highest goal in life is not to be the best husband or best father that I can possibly be. My highest goal in life is to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And listen, if I'm doing those things, then what other things are going to fall in right line, right? So many of us, we have this highest goal or this goal in mind that I, it is my highest goal in life to be the absolute best husband or father or coworker or son that I can possibly be. That's a great goal, right? At the failure of loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And listen, again, if I am loving the Lord my God first and foremost, if my means and my end is Jesus Christ, and the Lord God himself and all of these other things will fall in right line. Even, listen, even if I feel that I'm failing. Look at verse 16. We have this new perspective because sin has been forgiven. We can live into this newness because sin has been forgiven. Look at verse 16. He goes on. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Look at it again. From now on, therefore, we see our second conjunctive adverb. Okay, pointing backwards to a cause and forward to an effect. Christ died and was raised, right? Christ died and was raised. We died, Paul says. We died and were raised. Now, let's stop for a second because sometimes we stop and we're like, hold on a second. I didn't die. I died and was raised. How does that work? What does that mean? What does that look like? Right? I have not yet died. I have not yet been raised. What's going on right now? Essentially, what Paul is saying this is this. It's this. What has died is this mandatory inclination to sin. Okay? In Jesus, I don't have this mandatory inclination to sin, okay? In other words, 
You can not sin, okay? In Jesus, because the Spirit lives in me, I don't have to give in to the temptations that the evil one lays upon me, right? We have this idea sometimes with sin and temptation that when temptation, you know, the devil knows my buttons to push, and when he pushes that buttons, I just give in. Listen, friends, if that's what you believe, then you don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? Because with the Spirit living in you, you can not sin, okay? The devil knows your buttons to push, doesn't he? He knows your buttons, and he, sometimes we've got really big ones stuck on our chest right in the center of them, right? But with the power of the Spirit living in me, even though the devil pushes the buttons, I don't have to react the way that I would have, okay? I don't have to give it, and it's not, I don't live in light of this mandatory inclination to sin anymore. All of this has died, okay? It has died with Christ. Listen, so he goes on, from now on, therefore, conjunctive adverb, linking together, we regard no one according to the flesh, Forgiveness of sin changes everything, okay? Forgiveness of sin changes everything. We stop thinking about others with a worldly perspective because we, listen, we stop thinking about others from a worldly perspective because we are not thought of from a worldly perspective anymore. Praise God that I am not thought of by God from a worldly perspective anymore. That when God sees me, he doesn't see this, this, this Matthias who has a mandatory inclination towards sin. That when he sees me, what does he see? Jesus. And all of his beauty. And all of his grace. And all of his sacrifice. Forgiveness of sin changes everything. So we stop thinking about others from a worldly perspective because I'm not thought of anymore from a worldly perspective. My status, your status, our status with God has changed. Do you know that today? Your status with God has changed, and if your status with God has changed, then your thought process with others must also change from enemy to potential and hopeful brother, but I really don't like him. That's fair. Do you ever think the worst of people? Don't lie. Do you ever constantly look down on people? Are you quick to point out the flaws and deficits of others? Here's what's fantastic. You could be sitting there shaking your head right now at me. No, I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do that. But your inner monologue kicks in, and you're like, oh, crap, I do that. <laughs> we do this oftentimes, right? Hard, hard news for you. When we sit in these areas in our lives where we point out the deficits, where we're looking down on people, when we think the worst, listen, friends, none of these things are of Christ. None of these things are of Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts it like this in his book, Life Together. He says, if my sinfulness appears to me to be in any way smaller or less detestable in comparison with the sin of others, then I am still not recognizing my own sinfulness at all. In other words, it's this. If I'm looking at you, thinking the worst, pointing at all your flaws. Jesus says, I'm pointing at your, at your log, forgetting my speck. If I'm constantly pointing fingers at other people, your sin, your sin, your sin, if I am unwilling to live into forgiveness, then I don't know what forgiveness is at all. Then I don't know the depth of my own sin at all. I don't recognize my full need for Jesus at all. Forgiveness of sin changes everything. It changes and it causes us to look at our brother in unfeigned humility and serve him and desire for Christ to do a work in his life, even my enemy. Forgiveness changes everything. Listen, we have this new perspective because Jesus has made us a new person. We go on in verse 17. Because of Jesus, we're new people. I'm a new person, okay? Everything in me and everything about me is new and different because of Jesus. Any of you ever gone back to like your hometown and they scratch their heads thinking, whoa, 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 is that the Scott Myrick that I grew up with? That certainly cannot be when 
no way. Jesus changes everything. Because of Jesus, we're a new person. We're new people. Everything about us is new. Look at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Therefore, our third conjunctive adverbs. Linking. Linking things to Linking yesterday. Linking what was to what is. Linking a cause to an effect. Pointing backwards to the forgiveness and the love of Christ that we just talked about. And forward here to its effect. He is a new creation, completely new, unrecognizable maybe even. There are four essential statements within this verse. Look at this verse real quick, verse 17. It's four essential statements within this or four essential things within this verse. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Paul makes this right assessment that knowing Christ brings about a radical life change, okay? Knowing Christ causes radical life change, okay? In Christ, you you are new. The old way of living is gone. A new life is beckoning. It's beckoning, okay? Here's what we need reminded of today, okay? What Paul is trying to remind us of today is this. Paul's reminding us twice in this short statement of these things, okay? Many times what we focus on in in, in these verses and in life, many times what we focus on is the old has passed away. At the failure of and failing to fully realize that the new has come. I remember one year, we kind of go back to this nostalgia thing. I remember one year, uh, we gave my grandma uh, a new coffee pot for Christmas. My grandma uh, did not like her Christmas present. (laughs) She thought that the coffee that she made in her steel percolator on her stove tasted so much better. Okay? That coffee pot sat on the counter for at least a year before it ever got used on a regular basis. I really think the only time that she actually used it was when we came over. Okay? (laughs) But it goes back to this nostalgia things, remembering things better than they actually were or desiring things to go back to how they were, failing, listen, failing to take hold of the new things that the Lord is doing in our lives. Remember when it was like this? Remember when we had so much fun? Remember when? Remember when? Remember? Why do we do this? Why do we cling to the yesterdays, whether they were good or bad? Why do we cling to the yesterdays? I think we do these things because we're used to the old. I think about my grandma and making coffee on this steel percolator on her stove and how much time and effort she put into this on a regular basis. I think she did it and she ran back to it because the old is comforting. We know it's, she knew it's, it's quirks and it's idiosyncrasies. She knew exactly how long it was going to take and she was just used to it, right? Could it really, grandma said, could it really, could coffee really get any better than this? So she got stuck in this, in this thing, making comments and just constantly living in the yesterdays. That drip, drip coffee maker, which just could never be as good. There was a time that she actually started using it. Turns out she loved the ease of it. Turns out the steel percolator got put in the attic because she ended up loving the ease of it. She, she, she got used to the newness of the thing. Turns out, listen, turns out that there might be some getting used to this whole newness of life. Turns out that running from the devil pushing the buttons isn't as easy as maybe what we make it out to be. Turns out there's some getting used to it. Some getting used to it. Look at verses 18 to 21. It says this. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God, making his appeal through us. We implore you, on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Turns out there might take some and be some getting used to this newness that the Lord has blessed us with. Might take some getting used to this part of realizing and taking up this new purpose in life. But because of Jesus, we have new purpose. 
We see this here in verses 18 to 21. Again, it's not just the end, it's the means. This new purpose. To say that I have a new purpose means that I had an old one, right? Which I did, one taken upon myself in sin, in pride, by myself, right? Peruse these verses, and I think what you'll see as you walk through these verses is, is, is three themes here. First one is this. My purpose is to be reconciled to God in Christ. This is my purpose. What God intends in my life is to be reconciled to God in Christ. It says this, salvation ordained by God before the foundations of the world were ever established. Ephesians chapter, four, chapter 1, Paul says this. He says, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. This is what God intended for us, to be reconciled to him in salvation. This is what God intended. My purpose is to be reconciled to God in Christ. And therefore, my new purpose, in light of this, my new purpose, it says in verse 18, look at verse 18, all of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and what? Gave us the ministry of reconciliation. My new purpose is a ministry of reconciliation. But what exactly does that mean? If my new purpose is this ministry of reconciliation, what exactly does it mean, this ministry of reconciliation that my new purpose entails? He goes on in verse 19. My new purpose is basically its official representative to a foreign country. Look at verse 19. He says it like this. That is, in Christ... God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us this message of reconciliation. Here's what God has done, Paul says. And he's handed that ministry over to you, saying, show this to the world. The ministry of reconciliation. My new purpose is official representative to a foreign country. This is the message of Christ that we present and we proclaim the good news of God to the world. Verse 20, he goes on. Therefore, our final conjunctive adverb, our final connecting point in verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. So we implore you, on the behalf of Christ, he says, be reconciled to God. As God in Christ has brought us back to a right relationship with him, therefore, in all your newness, represent the good work of God to this foreign land. Let's pray. Father, we recognize and we realize the full life that you have granted and bestowed upon us, Father. And we say thank you this morning. God, we recognize and we see, God, that you have redeemed us, that you have called us away from these old things into new life, Father. And we realize this morning, God, that forgiveness changes everything. God, that it changes everything in my relationship with you and our relationship with you. But God, that it also changes everything in my relationship with other people. And so God, we pray this morning that this newness, God, that this newness would take root in our lives this morning. God, so many times I, we, live in this nostalgic perspective, God forgetting and not taking full grasp of the salvation that we have in Jesus, clinging sometimes to the past, desiring sometimes the past, whether it was good or bad. God, at the failure of living in all the new things that you have for us, Father. So God, this morning we pray that you would open our eyes to the new things that you have in store for us, we pray. Friends, we finally come to verse 21. Some of you thought I forgot it. But we look at verse 21 and Paul says this. He says, for our sake, 
He made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, this is the gospel. That sin has left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Today, the gospel is for you, unbeliever. To believe for the first time in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for all the new things that he offers in your life. Relationship with God in Jesus. Believer, today the gospel is for you. To remind you of all of the newness that the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has given you. The gospel is for you as well, believer. And it reminds you that forgiveness changes everything. So today, this morning, my encouragement, maybe even as Paul says here, we implore you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Friends, we have deacons in the back of the white tables. They would love to talk with you about what it means and what it looks like to be reconciled to God in Christ. What it means and what it would look like to join in fellowship here at the gathering. What it means and what it would look like just to stop and say, I need to remember and be reminded about the good news of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ in my life. They would love to talk with you as we stand and as we respond as believers to the good news of God. So let's stand and sing this morning. I refuse to trust in who I am. I refuse to follow my own plans. When fear is fierce, I will lift up my hands. And I will say that I believe you.
good in everything, in every season, in every drought. You are the rain that's always pouring out. You are good. You are good. So we celebrate your goodness. your provision even when we don't see it or maybe when we see it very clearly but we know your character and we know that we are created new in you so help us as we walk in that newness help us to follow you with our hearts and our souls and our minds that we would display your glory and your love, your mercy and your grace to those around us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Have a great week.